Welcome to another edition of the Go Knows Podcast. I am your host, Gregory McCoy. This podcast is by a fan for fans. I am not a journalist. I am not a reporter. I am not a insider. I do not work for a website. The majority of my content comes from me, in my opinion. Other information comes from the internet. Today is January 25th, 2020. And I got about six different segments here that I wrote for this episode. And I hope you enjoy it. First, can the Florida State defensive line dominate? And here's what I wrote about that. Can the defensive can the Florida State defensive line dominate? I don't know. The talent there says yes, but mentally, is this group strong enough to overcome the nonsense that has plagued this program the last three seasons? Um, they will be switching back to a four three hybrid scheme. But the outside linebacker hybrid still remain on this roster. Andy Fuller, the defensive coordinator, will have to play these guys. Um, the starters are Kando, Durden, Wilson, and Robinson. Robert Cooper will play a lot. True Thompson will play a lot. Hopefully, Jarrett Jackson, Manny Rogers will contribute also. I think the uh, previously stated guys will rotate at defensive tackle, uh, Jackson and Rogers, whereas uh, the hybrid guys, uh, Quayshawn Fuller, Malcolm Ray, Derek McClendon, Jamarcus Chapman, Ricardo Watson, can step in and play either defensive end spot. Also, Josh Griffiths, true freshman, will hopefully get a look also. Um, I recently saw on the internet that the uh, coaching staff offered some JUCO defensive ends. Um, so we will see what this uh, this defensive line group can do. Um, hopefully we can get back to this being a strength of the program. Um, I think the defensive line is going to be fine. I think you really got some talent there. Um, you know, the real question is, is when... You know, Kando and Robinson can't play every snap. Wilson and uh, Durden can't play every snap. So you're going to have to figure out, you know, a second and third rotation. Um, so those guys don't have to play the whole game because they'll play great for half. And then the second half, they're gassed. So I, I don't care what kind of strength and conditioning you got. You're not going to be able to play, you know. A, a whole 60 minute game without you know coming off the field for a break or a breather you know so you have to sub in so the the question is can Andy Fuller identify who his second and third team defensive line uh, defensive line uh, subs are going to be so let me know what you think about that segment the next segment is weirdest place you have watched a florida state football game and this is what i wrote about that weirdest place you have watched a florida state football game back in the day before smartphone phones and youtube and internet we had handheld tvs with antennas the screen on my uh handheld tv was three by three inches very small um, I used to be a security guard back in the day, and my commitment to be a, being a fan was even crazier back then because you didn't have access to all the uh, abundance of information that you do now. So one would rely on TV to get sports info. Um, I never had weekends off back then at this particular job. I was not allowed to have electronics. Um, the security guard job, um, this was like back in 1996, so um, I watched the 1996 Florida versus Florida State uh, National Championship at work on a handheld TV. It was crazy because I think my supervisor at the time saw me and she didn't write me up. I think she realized that it. You know, everybody knew I was a Florida State fan and she realized that it was the national championship. So she didn't, you know, give me any problems. But 
um you know it was the, the particular uh, site they had me at was working in you know downtown metro uh, downtown metropolitan area and on this particular night it wasn't a lot of traffic coming through so i guess she just let me slide but i literally watched the whole game at work that's when florida throttled us um i mean we i mean they had internet back then but it was like aol dial up or some crap i mean it wasn't like it is now like broadband and you know google fiber and all this other stuff um gigabit internet um you know we didn't the average person didn't have like internet and smartphones were like they were out but they were like uh i forget what they called them back then uh wasn't smartphones it was some other kind of crazy name they had blackberries back then um but even then it didn't have like apps and you know just stuff you could just look up at the touch of a button so this is how you had to get your sports man get your football fix if you was a, you know a real fan this is the stuff that you had to do to, in order to watch games um so it might not seem like a weird place but you know it was weird enough for me so let me know what you think about that segment um next is gonna be ceo coach versus play caller coach all right and um uh, let me see i'm looking from a paper here um or no no i skipped one my bad most annoying person in college football all right and this is what i wrote about that most annoying person in college football it's a tie between nick saban and dabo sweeney i have never seen two of the most annoying winners in my life let's start with nick saban he can be rude he can be rude and condescending at times i understand that he wants his team to always play with a sense of urgency but it's alabama so it's only so much of that stuff that's going to uh go over in college football um then we got dabble sweeney he really should have gotten the top spot but i really wanted to spotlight both of these guys um the man won 29 29 games in a row and he's playing the underdog role um you know you got the best qb you got the number one recruiting class for 2020 i mean can we just stop the nonsense that underdog stuff won't work now i wish more coaches would stop being humble and just say i got a great team we'll play anybody and uh you know we'll take anybody's best shot um that's what that's what orgeron did down in lsu this year he said it plenty of times I, I feel like i got a great team we'll play anybody anywhere i love that um and just you know side note to Dabo swinney take the cupcakes off the schedule man wofford the citadel charlotte akron can we take them off the schedule can i mean can i get an oregon state can i get a san diego state can i get something where where there's actually a, a actual threat i mean geez and then when your team gets into the playoffs you, you guys get punched in the mouth you can't respond back your when your team is always used to putting up 60 70 points on people then they get into a game and they can't do it you know the referees help clemson in the and i'm getting off on a tangent <laughs> referees helped them in the ohio state game but they had no response in the LSU game. But like I said, I'm getting off on a tangent. So I'm just going to whatever. All right. Um, but it's a tie between Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney for the two most annoying people in college football. All right. Um, so let me know what you think about that segment. Next segment is the one i stated at first ceo coach versus play caller coach which is better the ceo model is winning right now urban meyer nick saban dabble sweeney 
Ed Orgeron. The play caller, Jimbo Fisher, rarely wins titles. You can go back the last 20 years and see the CEO model is more successful. When a head coach can focus on the whole operation, generally you win. Norvell is a play caller. Willie Taggart was a play caller until he realized that he had more duties um, than just running the offense. Then he hired Kendall Bryles, and he still meddled in the, um, in the offense. Um, so I think Norvell will go through the same thing. Um, I think he's going to have some growing pains there, but he's going to have to realize that overseeing the whole operation is going to be better than just focusing in on the offense. Um, Bobby Bowden used this model pretty much his whole career at Florida State, and it was very successful. So maybe Norvell will adapt to that role. The CEO, co the CEO coach is more detailed about football, and the more detailed a coach is, the more successful he usually will be. Um, like I said in that statement, you can go back the last 20 years and just... <laughs> excuse me, look at the coaches who've won national championships. They've been like the type of coach that oversees the whole operation, making sure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed. That's what we need at Florida State. So let me know what you think about that segment. Next up is going to be cover, cover corner versus zone corner, which is more difficult. And this is basically the Revis Sherman beef that has been going on pretty much this whole week um so i just wanted to throw my little two cents on it cover cover excuse me cover corner versus zone corner which is more valuable i could make the case for either one but cover corner is obviously the more the more coveted because of one guy and that's prime time deon sanders he revolutionized the position he basically basically created cover corner um Cover guys are usually very fast and zone guys are uh, usually cover guys are very fast and zone guys are very slow. Um, rarely do you see a DB who has both skills that can play zone and man. I think in my opinion now, Charles Woodson is the closest player. To, to get to that that balance of being a great zone corner and a great man corner. Um, zone guys play with discipline, whereas cover guys can freelance a little bit more. They only have to worry about one guy. Zone, co zone corners play a defensive scheme, defensive scheme in which they depend on underneath coverage and over the top coverage to have their back. A cover corner only depends on himself. Now, as this relates to Florida State's defensive backs who were, who did not play very well last season, um, hopefully Norvell and Andy Fuller and the defensive staff can get these guys all on the same page. So let me know what you think about that segment. Cover corner versus zone corner. Who, who do you think is more valuable? I mean, I just think... It just depends on what the coach is asking you to do. You know, if he wants you to go out there and play cover three, cover four, great. If he wants you to play man, cool. To me, it's harder to play zone because the receiver is in, in, in essence getting a free release off the line and he can go anywhere he wants. Uh, the great thing that Sherman does is he uses the sideline as an extra defender. And he, he basically rides the receiver up to the sideline in that cover three scheme. Um, he's been doing that his whole career. And he's great at it. For what he's asked to do, he's great at it. So um, that's all you can ask. Um, next segment. Let me know what you think about that segment. Next segment is going to be five questions for Mike Novell. Number five. Can strength and conditioning take a quantum leap in year one? Number four, can you put a winner on the field in year one? Um, do you have any NFL aspirations? 
Is the starting QB on this roster or committed to this team right now? And my number one question to Mike Norvell, if I could ever get him for an interview, is, is the offensive line, <clears throat> excuse me, the top priority for this program? So if anybody's listening to this that has any connection to uh, Mike Norvell, please pass those questions along to him. I would greatly appreciate it. And let me know what you think about those five questions. All right. Last, top 10 places for championship games. It can be college or pro. And this is my list. Number 10, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And I don't know the names of all of the stadiums, so I just named the cities. Uh, the Rose Bowl, Pasadena, California. Uh, number eight, Las Vegas. The Raiders' new stadium is absolutely gorgeous. I think that's going to be an instant premier site for championship games. Los Angeles, California. Their new stadium is beautiful. I think that's going to be a destination. Okay, number six, Houston, Texas. Um, number five, Miami. How many how many national championships and Super Bowls have Miami has Miami hosted? Uh, Atlanta, their new stadium, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Santa Clara, the San Francisco 49ers uh, new stadium. Atlanta was number four. Santa Clara was number three. Uh, number two, Arlington, Texas, Jerry's World. And number one, New Orleans, Louisiana. They've hosted like everything. So I don't think there's any better place than New Orleans to host a uh, championship sporting event. Um, that's going to do it for this episode. Let me know what you think about it. This podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify Podcasts. Um, if you're listening to this on YouTube, please scroll down to the description. Click on one of the links. Rate, review, subscribe. I greatly appreciate all the support. I really appreciate everyone that listens to this podcast on a daily basis. And as always, go Knowles.